Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana lefty. Welcome to CMMNJ TV. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. I'm Ken Walski, Executive Director of the Coalition for Medical Marijuana in New Jersey. The mission of our organization is to educate the public about the benefits of marijuana. Marijuana is a safe, effective, and inexpensive therapeutic agent for a wide variety of diseases, symptoms, and conditions. No patient should suffer needlessly without it, and no patient should ever go to jail for following the advice of a doctor. Join us and learn more about the exciting science of medical marijuana. Hey, welcome to another episode of CMMNJ TV. We're going to talk about some of the activism happening out there in New Jersey. My name is Chris Goldstein. I'm joined here in the studio with comedian and activist N.A. Poe from Philadelphia, who's also active here in New Jersey, and of course, CMMNJ's executive director, Ken Wolski. And although Ken wears a suit and a tie on most days, he also is a firm believer in civil disobedience. So we're going to talk about uh, what happened in New Jersey just last week. There are a number of uh, activism moments that have happened in front of the State House in New Jersey, but perhaps the largest happened just last weekend with the Spring Smoke Out. Tell us a little bit more about that event and who put it together. Well, it seems as if uh, New Jersey Weed Man and the East Coast Cannabis Coalition got together, and uh, I think they believe they did civil disobedience a few times, and this one was the largest one. I believe that although it was reported that dozens of people were there, there was a couple hundred people there, and, and you know everyone smoked marijuana openly, even though I personally was like looking over my shoulder the whole entire time. Uh, New Jersey Weed Man was just throwing uh, edibles out to the crowd, and there was a small state police presence uh, with no um, interference. Most importantly, there was a lot of poignant, poignant people there speaking about, you know, what was going on. Uh, Ricardo Rivera was there talking about his daughter, Tuffy. Um, I met Joanne Zito for the first time. Um, it seems that a lot of people are starting to come together, especially in New Jersey, to fight for all patients' rights. And, uh, you know, Ken is here working on the legislation and, you know, and also supporting civil disobedience, like you said, from... The minute that I met Ken and we started doing civil disobedience, Ken has always been a great supporter. But Ken works so much legislatively, and that hand in hand is starting to uh, make some progress. Ken, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. yeah I, I, you know, Ken, you've been in this movement for quite some time, and you you gave us great support at Smoke Down Prohibition in in Philadelphia. You came and spoke there a number of times, uh, not always wearing a suit and tie, sometimes wearing your nurse's lab coat. Um, but also, why do you think it's important for uh, people to be both active on the streets as well as in the legislature? Well, just to clarify, I, I didn't actually engage in, in civil disobedience. You're a supporter, not an actor. I, I support yeah. it. Uh, uh, you know, I go back to the 60s and I engaged in civil disobedience then, and uh, uh, I think those days uh, I put behind me, although I have a great deal of respect for people who engage in civil disobedience, like uh, my two colleagues here. Uh, I think that, that what you do shows a tremendous amount of courage, and you, you show that the, the laws are not worthy of respect, and, and you're willing to accept the uh, the, the repercussions for your actions too. You know, it's not like just getting high in a park. It's actually getting going out and, and making it making a very important political statement when you use marijuana like this. And, and like all the people who engaged in, in civil disobedience did at, at the spring smoke out at the uh, at the state house recently. So I'm, I'm very proud of these people. I'm I'm very proud of the people who engage in in civil disobedience, and I support support what you're doing 100 um, percent. And uh, so, um, but but just just to be clear that I, I was not actually engaged. <laughs> in so. Well, I mean, I think it takes a team, and 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 it takes all types of people to do all different things. I don't necessarily like doing legislative meetings. I don't. I just I don't do that well, you know. Right. But I know what I do well, and I think everyone working on their strengths is what is actually bringing this all together. Hey, we're bringing media to the state house because people are all smoking outside. And then that's fine, regular people see that, and then they see our demands, and they see that, hey, you know, there's legislation to try to make things better, and I think that that draws attention to it, and then, you know, it's kind of set them up and knock them down uh, type of approach. You know, and after what we went through with the army of police that we encountered on federal land in Philadelphia, are, are you both sort of surprised at uh, how 
hands off the Trenton uh, yeah. State Police Bureau was uh, yeah, to these protests. Very surprised and pleased that the uh, the state police took a hands off approach, and of course, you know, the city of Trenton also took a hands off approach. I mean, mm -hmm. they 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 certainly were aware of the demonstration going on, and they took no action. I mean, I understand one person got arrested during the march, but it was for an alcohol-related event rather, really? than, rather mm. than for anything to do with marijuana. <laughs> so, you know, the, the police, uh, to, be, to be fair, you know, the police in Trenton ha uh, have lost a lot of their members. Uh, you know, the, the Trenton is struggling financially. It's uh, many of the inner cities in New Jersey are on the verge of collapse. So uh, to be arresting peaceful, nonviolent uh, people who are making a political statement you know, that's, it's really stretching your budget to try to do something like that. Yeah, uh, New Jersey should take some of that blood money and try to regrow their economy. I think that uh, they could maybe get more police and maybe get, take care of those potholes, kind of. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and the program was handled really well. I think, you know, the uh, New Jersey Weed Man uh, 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 did a really good job in coordinating this. Uh, he, he spoke with the, he kept the lines of communication with the state police open. He uh, established parameters about where they were involved and where they would be concerned if, if marijuana was smoking, smoking was taking place. Uh, nobody was blowing smoke in a policeman's face. Uh, so, you know, they, there were respectful limits, and, and I think that this, this uh, movement really needs to progress with these kind of respectful limits for, and I'll be for, honest, for proper authority. The police are not our enemies, you know. The police are there to enforce laws. But it's our job to change the laws that the, that the police enforce. Well, but as you make an interesting point, though. Is it is their job to enforce the law, but in this case, they look the other way. Um, and that's what's so bizarre, is that in New Jersey, we'll see 21,000 people arrested for marijuana possession this year, unless you're engaged in an act of uh, peaceful, coordinated civil disobedience. Isn't there kind of a strange dichotomy there going on? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's really a disgrace that 21,000 people are arrested in New Jersey every year for marijuana offenses, over 90% of them just for m possession of small amounts uh, at a cost of over $121 million. It, it really is a disgrace. I mean, it's, it's boring, too, at this point. I mean, I committed civil disobedience in Delaware, Philadelphia, and New Jersey over the past two weeks. And there's, it was really nice at New Jersey to see everyone smoking openly. Being at Smoke Down Prohibition, Smoke Down 4 was the last time that I felt the freedom of being like, hey, stranger, here's a joint. And there's something about you know, that camaraderie. My fear, which I expressed before that, was they allowed us with Smoke Down Prohibition to have four really nice events. And I mean, after the fourth event, I was ready to start booking vendors, hot dog vendors, to be able to give out to the thousands of people in the crowd. And then we encountered, you know, a strong police presence with a governor that's so anti-marijuana and actually talks rhetoric that makes him seem like a politician from the 50s. Yeah. I'm actually surprised that nothing has happened yet. And I kind of cautiously, cautiously optimistic about the future is if you bring this to a boiling point, if Ed Fortune keeps following people around, if you guys keep pressing legislatively, what is the pushback going to be from, you know, Jersey officials? And, and I think that, sadly, if that were to happen, that maybe the people would see that how ridiculous it is. Say if they arrested 50 people for marijuana, maybe the public would speak up, you know? I mean, a lot of times politics are dominated not by the will of the people, but by the will of the people that are representing them. And, and I think right. that, you know, that needs to change. I have a question for you, Ken. It, these people in legislation have been dealing with you for years, right? I mean, so they know at this point that you're not some pothead guy. I mean, you're Ken, Ken you're a nurse. You come to all these things. Don't, at this point, don't you have kind of, don't they realize that there's a legitimacy to, to the cause? And with PTSD, I mean, is this something that possibly if the governor shuts this down, I mean, that's something you probably make a pretty big deal at, you know, not getting veterans access to marijuana. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that the medical marijuana movement really has established itself as a legitimate movement in everybody's eyes except Governor Christie, you know, who, hmm. who continues to say that all such programs are just a front for legalization, uh, not realizing that it's his resistance that has has spurred legalization talk because these the medical marijuana program is so unworkable and so so difficult to access in New Jersey. Um, Post traumatic stress disorder is probably the most sympathetic of the uh, conditions that we can add as qualifying conditions for marijuana therapy in New Jersey because. Uh, because, of, because of the nature of the disease. It's so difficult to treat um, uh, because 22 veterans in, in the United States commit suicide every day uh, because, they, because 
they're, they're inadequately treated for their post-traumatic stress disorder, and because so many people actually suffer from PTSD. It's not just for veterans, it's for victims of childhood abuse, for sexual abuse, yeah. for any traumatic uh, event that may have uh, resulted in a characteristic set of symptoms that really impair the proper functioning of the person and, and that marijuana can help with them. Well, what would you say to a state like Pennsylvania that has only 10 qualifying conditions? Here you are five, six years into fighting to try to expand those conditions. When politicians in Pennsylvania promise us that those conditions will be expanded to include more conditions, should we believe something like that? Well, we don't really know what the, what the bill is going to look like at this point. Uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, I testified recently at a, a Assembly Health and Judiciary Committee uh, and they were not talking about a specific bill. They were not, I mean, SB3 yeah, this was, was the a House. very good yeah. bill. Uh, before it was gutted. Yeah. Uh, SB3 was a very good bill before it was gutted and then uh, it was gutted during the legislative process. But that was when we had a very different uh, governor uh, at, in, in, in Pennsylvania. Now Governor Wolf is very receptive to the uh, idea of medical marijuana and marijuana reform in general. So I think... Well, but that's so a catch-22. Well, Chris, how do we take advantage of a sympathetic governor as marijuana reformers in Pennsylvania that have a bill that kind of has them backed into a corner, essentially? Yeah, I think that that's, that's what's uh, strange about Pennsylvania right now, is that Governor Wolf will sign whatever comes across his desk, but now the legislators who aren't uh, in favor of a more expanded program know that. So they're going to fight for a more restrictive bill because they know the governor will sign it. Whereas Governor Corbett wouldn't sign anything and they just sort of dilly-dallied around. And that's what's unfortunate about this session. They reintroduced the most restrictive language uh, for Pennsylvania's bill. And we've pointed at New Jersey. We've had plenty of New Jersey patients. You know, at the first hearings for this, we had John Wilson, an MS patient who was... Uh, you know, prosecuted for 17 plants come and testify in 2009 in Pennsylvania. And during these last session, including the one where you testified recently, Ken, we had Irv Rosenfeld, one of the four federal medical marijuana patients who <coughs> smokes 300 joints a month supplied by you and I. But right now, smoking is not allowed in the Pennsylvania medical marijuana bill. And they keep they've never talked about reintroducing that concept. Well, well Chris, then the, and Ken as well. With all these state infighting with medical marijuana, different regulations, different ways to do it, you can grow your own, you can't. Is it now maybe time for us to turn our focus to the federal government and start working on trying to unite as a movement and find a way to legalize across the board federally or at least deschedule, you know, and start taxing and regulating, uh, starting that process? Well, I, you, you know, you bring up an interesting word, which is deschedule. I was on the phone with Gary Johnson yesterday, former New Mexico governor, and, you know, he believes in descheduling marijuana, taking it out of the Controlled Substances Act completely. But what we saw Senator Booker, Senator Gillibrand, and Senator Paul introduce a few weeks ago was a bill that would reschedule marijuana, move it to Schedule II in the Controlled Substances Act, which would effectively put it under control of the FDA and the other federal regulators. But yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, now is the time to look at, you know, rather than having this uh, extended patchwork of laws that work and don't work, and there aren't that many that work, quite frankly. You said there's about six really functional medical marijuana programs. You would say Oregon, California, Colorado. Oregon, Washington, Maine, Michigan, possibly Arizona. But when you talk about 23 states, again, you're counting those pretty much on one hand that are actually working for patients. You know, states like New Jersey are not working for patients. States like Delaware are four years into a law and they don't even have their first dispensary open yet. Um, you know, maybe you saw a press recently, Virginia has become a medical marijuana state. Well, that's completely wrong. They passed a law well, that's the time a medical when, necessity defense. You know? And the time from when it passes to actual implementations. I've talked to some of the mothers in Pennsylvania that politicians are prob promising them a six-month startup time. I said, mm -hmm. I will run naked through the courthouse, um, not the courthouse, the state house, and I'm... And, uh, <laughs> Do the courthouse too. If, if that's it, up yeah. in six months, and right now I'm inviting you gentlemen to take that challenge uh, as well with me. Uh, the naked run through the uh, General Assembly of Pennsylvania. If they implement the medical marijuana law in six months, you got I six will, months. Wolf. I will definitely take that challenge with you. Um, but um, and I, I think that that may be an effective thing. It's sort of like a polar bear plunge for medical marijuana. But I also think that at the end of the day, we've never seen a state actually follow their timeline for implementation. There is no state that has, other than the states early on early. that passed home cultivation provisions. You know, when you have home cultivation built into a law, the implementation's a lot easier because patients start growing it. It's that simple. Right. But when you have the implementation have to include 
uh, regulatory phase for retail and, you know, Pennsylvania's law includes laboratories, processing facilities, as well as distribution centers. Isn't there a case, though, to talk to a bankrupt federal government and uh, states that have destroyed infrastructure and no jobs, like Ken's talking about New Jersey, isn't there a case to be made to the federal government that we could essentially regrow our own economy and, and across the board and be able to maybe flourish again? And you said to me earlier, you know, I think that, um, I but, forgot what I was saying. Go well, that's, that's <laughs> the thing about this, though. I mean, you know, let's look at, uh, I did an analysis of Pennsylvania's under, and I've done this for New Jersey as well, the, the current underground marijuana economy. Basically, how much are people spending on marijuana today with it being unregulated? And I estimated in Pennsylvania, a state of 12 million people, that there was $2.3 billion of marijuana sold over the course of a year. Now, are, is everybody who is in the underground economy, all the people who are in every class, every neighborhood, uh, every ethnicity in Pennsylvania who is selling a little bit of marijuana, growing a little bit of marijuana, will they have a chance under a regulated scheme? You know, what we've seen in other states that have attempted this is that those who are able to get into the legal end of the business also have to have a lot of capital behind them at the beginning. These are not necessarily small mom and pop operations. So, yeah, I mean, I think that you could regrow the economy if only you can bring the entire underground market above board en masse. Would you settle for 60%? Even if it was 50-50, you're not really getting the buy-in because that's what we're seeing in Colorado. And again, I don't see it as, a, as quite as much of a failure. I know a lot of the naysayers say, ah, oh, there's still a black market in Colorado. Everybody didn't buy over. Well, there's two sides of that equation. Again, there wasn't a regulatory structure necessarily built just to bring the underground economy above ground. It was just to create a new regulated economy. Well, because you're economy. pushing out the people that are growing and that are dealing small, and you're having these large companies come in that want to mass produce marijuana and sell it to tourists, and maybe that's the way that it should be. Look, I'll never pay for marijuana. I'm not going to go and buy a $70 eighth. I mean, I may want to I think you're going to do it for the novelty. Symbolically, But, but that's of the thing. Like, you know, at the end of the day, most people in America who are in the underground economy for marijuana aren't getting rich doing it, they're getting by. It's already an important part of how the economy operates, especially for low and middle class income people. So until we create a regulatory scheme that focuses on how to engage those underground entrepreneurs and bring them above board with their small businesses, essentially, right. so that they can continue to be uh, contributing to their families, contributing to their uh, communities, and doing it legally, I'm not sure we're going to have a real answer to maximize on that potential. Well, okay. cha changing federal law really is the holy grail of uh, marijuana reform. And uh, I, I think you didn't really give enough credit to uh, Senator Booker's uh, Carers Act and, and what it would do. You know, certainly descheduling is an ideal to shoot for, descheduling marijuana altogether. But just changing marijuana from a Schedule One to a Schedule Two is, would be an enormous sea change in the United States. I mean, the United States, marijuana has been a Schedule One drug since 1970. Since well, Schedule Two, you can stu Schedule Two, you can study study it for medicinal benefits. Right? Yes, you can. You can. You can do research on it. Uh, and and. Uh, but it's still classified <clears throat> the same as cocaine and oxycontin. Okay. At that level. All right. Yes, that's true. But now it's scheduled. Now it's more serious than cocaine and oxycontin. And uh, and by changing it to a schedule, but the other thing that the CARES Act would do would be to respect the state laws. See, Chris, that's the, well, it would I'm not worried about stop the, federal interference with the state laws, whether they're medical they, the laws federal or laws. Or but that's the right. thing, Ken. They've never interfered. You know, when when the the Rohrbacher, they have <laughs> not ever they have not ever gone into a state office. They have not tried to attempt to interfere with a state's implementation of a law. Have they raided individual right. businesses? Yes. yes. Okay. But the definition of interference under the Careers Act and under the far Rawbacher Amendment uh, that passed in the omnibus spending package last year was the federal government interfering with the implementation of a law. Now, maybe that's a theory in New Jersey. If they came in and raided all three of the only operating ATCs, <laughs> they would be interfering with the implementation of the law. But the federal government has never done that. They have never attempted to prosecute a state employee for doing their job by issuing registry cards. Well, so at the end of the day... Yeah, but they've certainly interfered I, with state laws. No, and I understand what you're saying about interfering with state laws, and I just... I saw that bill as kind of like a lip service type of thing because, like Chris said, like they are pretty much are 
hands off on the states to a certain extent. You've seen a lot less raids since Colorado went legal. I'm not saying that they're not happening. Um, and then you have the PTSD introduction, which is a wonderful thing. And then you have the descheduling. But I mean, for where we are, that's not the type of federal bill that I personally want. I think that we're at a point where we could probably get something a little more uh, liberal that's going to maybe help us before Obama leaves office. I think we can do better than that bill. And and my um, concern about careers and, and about rescheduling also is that taking it simply to Schedule 2, yes, it, it respects the existing state laws, but again, it doesn't inspire states like New Jersey and Delaware to do better. Oh, well, and it certainly does, Chris. It inspires states uh, like New Jersey to really reconsider the, uh, the dangers that the federal government has been insisting uh, have been associated with uh, with marijuana. Now, you know, when you, when you reschedule it, you say, well, no, this is public acknowledgement that the government, that the federal government's uh, dangers that they've been saying about marijuana that... Uh, uh, well, but again, you're right, it's a good olive branch, Ken, you're right. As, as someone that's too involved in marijuana activism, I want it all. But you're right, it, it is symbolically and to average Americans and to just the idea of marijuana reform becoming a reality across the board, it is, it is a big step and I don't mean to be cynical. And, well, what and, about and, the and regulatory it would, structure? It would encourage legalization. It would encourage other states to, to pursue legalization and, and that legalization would not be interfered with by the federal government. But is there a tipping no, point, Chris? What you need is a law, Chris. We don't have a law right now. We have some... We have some guidelines from the federal government, but we don't have a law, and that's what we need. I don't disagree with that, and and you know I, I do think that uh, again an attempt at the change is important. But I've also seen how this process has worked in several states, and the idea is that states right now ignore the Schedule One status when they regulate a medical marijuana law. Right, they, so they're they directly contradicting. They're di directly. We already have these states directly contradicting federal law, and now you have federal law saying, well, okay, maybe that's okay. Well, you know? and also by directly con by ignoring federal law and the federal oversight agencies for scheduled substances. When New Jersey implemented the medical marijuana law, it actively ignored the DEA, the FDA, NIDA, the right, they're viola Institute in violation of, of federal law. So all of a sudden, when it's Schedule Two, and let's not act like there isn't uh, stacks of regulation associated with Oxycontin and cocaine and how those substances are handled and implemented, don't those federal agencies get to have more say in how a state actually regulates their marijuana at that point? Eventually they would eventually when it becomes uh, available in pharmacies. But you're talking years down the road, Chris. Even, even outside of pharmacies. Again, what state agencies do, there's a standoff nature. Once a state legalizes medical marijuana and pursues that regulatory route, the NIH you know, and all the federal acronyms ignore that state's medical marijuana laws and the, medical, the states right. ignore the Fed. But now, at Schedule 2, they do have to find some common ground to come together. And again, by descheduling it, you avoid all those issues. By rescheduling it, you sort of but reinvigorate that. I, I welcome federal marijuana regulations. I think that federal marijuana regulations would... You're going to rue the days of would, that. I know, right? <laughs> would, would, would make uniform marijuana law a reality. And we're seeing with the way that they're struggling in Jer New Jersey like this. And then, you know, when... Oregon goes legal, it's not going to have the same system as Colorado. When Washington went legal, it doesn't have the same system. So it's like, all of a sudden, now you have all these states doing their own thing. If we could uniform say, this is how it's tagged and bagged and got out, you know, from the top down, I feel like then all the states would be more welcome to do it. And then you know what? If you don't want to, if Kansas doesn't want to have legal marijuana, that's fine. Just, you can't arrest anyone for marijuana then. Like, just... Well, again, that's, that's, that's the misstep, I think, of careers, is that it at no point deals with anything as far as federal decriminalization. Getting, getting caught with CDS on federal land, like you and I were caught with marijuana on federal land, it would be no different if you and I were caught with unprescribed Oxycontin or cocaine. It would be no different than if we were caught with uh, alcohol, for that matter. So, at that point, even on federal land, patients would still be subject to uh, federal uh, 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 laws in regards to possession. So, you know, yes, it recognizes state laws, but even a Schedules II substance is something that's going to get somebody possibly prison time for possessing a small amount in a national park. So, well, you know, it doesn't, you know, if you really want to protect patients and if you really want to protect consumers, um, again, I, I think a better step is to, for the federal government to reconsider the same laws that you and I were prosecuted under, which is essentially the criminal possession law. So what, not, to re, not to reiterate this idea, but why isn't the marijuana government, 
you hear me, MPP uh, and normal. Why aren't they formulating a plan to, by the end of Obama's administration, try to take on? Why isn't a decriminalization bill being lobbied by the marijuana lobby well, to be able to, to, to clear the board? No more marijuana arrests. Obama, he could drone strike people for the next two years if he did that and people would love him. Because you've got to, you've got to make progress incrementally as we have been making progress. And the Carers Act uh, is, is an example of this incremental progress. Is uh, incremental progress needed? I mean, that's, again, uh, and this is just a philosophical I'm done debate. with incremental You know, on, on a level, I mean, when, when the 1937 marijuana tax stamp was introduced in Congress, it was debated for nine hours. I mean, it wasn't an incremental change in policy. When the 1970 Controlled Substances Act was implemented, it was written and implemented in 90 days. You know, these were not incremental steps towards prohibition. Will prohibition change incrementally? Will something that that took such a short time and it's such a large step change incrementally, or does it need to come back in such a large step too? Well, you don't have a model for it, Chris. What what model right. do you have for for change for this? Uh, the end of alcohol prohibition. Change. I, I think the change, end of alcohol you know? prohibition is a good good example of that. And also, when we talk about how things are regulated, you say Kansas, you know, and a, and a top down. Uh, federal marijuana policy. That's not what we employ for alcohol and tobacco. We allow the state's broad uh, latitude right. on how they regulate things. And uh, although the Careers Act says the states would have broad latitude to do it, uh, again, federal uh, agencies, uh, you know, states have broad latitude on how they implement OxyContin laws and cocaine laws and how they're distributed in pharmacies right now. I mean, Pennsylvania has a pharmaceutical monitoring system. New Jersey's got a pharmaceutical, mon you know, monitoring system. Not all states have that. But will federal policy really make things better? We thank you for uh, spending time with us here today on CMMNJ TV. And make sure to check us out on Facebook, on Twitter. You can find uh, Ken on Twitter as well. And APO and myself, Chris Goldstein, we're all in social media. Make sure to reach out. Have a great day. For more information about the Coalition for Medical Marijuana in New Jersey, join us at our free public meetings on the second Tuesday of every month at the Lawrence Township Library in Mercer County, New Jersey, from 7 to 9 p.m. Snacks are served and all are welcome. Remember, every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone's arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, somebody's arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone's arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, somebody is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone's arrested for cannabis. Every 42 seconds, someone's arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for cannabis. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Cada 42 segundo, está uno arrestado por marijuana. Every 42 seconds, somebody is arrested for. Every 42 seconds, someone in this country is arrested for marijuana. Shut down this second, you are the for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. Every 42 seconds, someone is arrested for marijuana. It could be you. <laughs>